appreciate you. God is good. The Bible says where the Lord, the, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Oh, I mean, I sought the Lord concerning this meeting. And I am delighted because the things that I petitioned, even deep within my heart, beyond my consciousness, the Lord was revealing it to me right here. I'm going to show you one of them real quick if you were turning your Bibles with me to Psalms, the book of Psalms chapter 2 verse 4. Uh, for those of you that are new, welcome, good to see you. I know some of you have been watching online, so you don't even feel like you're new, but we're still happy to see you anyway, um, in person, so good to see you. Now, it is very customary of us to stand and read at least one verse of scripture. We're not religious about it, we're just committed to it. Um, and the reason why, one of the reasons why, is because our communion house, one of the things that is of great interest to us is to be doers of the word of God. You see, because we know that the Bible says that in the last days, power would be given to that dragon, the same serpent of old, with which to deceive the nations. So when you come to a dispensation that is officially the era of deception, what do you do? You ensure that you guard your heart with all diligence. And one of the ways by which our hearts are immune to deception is to not just be hearers of the word only. You know, some people are hearers of the word. Some people are just repeaters of what they've heard. But the Bible says, do not be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. Because the one who hears alone deceives himself. That's what the Bible says. Do not be deceivers of yourself. Now, the danger of deceiving yourself is because the Bible says the deceiver will be deceived. So when you deceive yourself, you become prone to deception that is external. So what do we do at communion house? We do the word every chance we get. And what does the word of God say? Especially concerning evening meetings. The Bible says, come bless the Lord, you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. And so when we stand, what do we stand to do? David says, I will stand and I will declare your wonderful works. What is the origin of the works of God? Let me, let me share with you an insight real quick. If you, if you need help standing, just lean on the person next to you. Let me say this, folks. Many of us are waiting to see the works of God concerning the things that we desire, concerning the things that we have asked of God. And you're waiting that whenever that happens, then you will give him praise. Oh, I remember there was a time in the body of Christ, in the church, there was a song that went viral. I mean, we all sang it. In fact, when we went to birthday parties and they didn't play that song, we didn't dance. I'm not going to mention any names, but the song sounds like this. Take the shackles of my feet so that I can dance. But that is the opposite of what we find in the Bible. We, we went on saying, oh, take the shackles off my feet so I can dare hands. I want to praise you. That's not true. If you truly want to praise him, you will praise him regardless of the shackles. But it's, it's, that was where we were, okay? Because before you go find a video of me dancing to that song way back when, that was where we all were. How many people ever danced to that song? Raise your hand, Antonio, because I know you did. You look like you would have. Praise God. But what did the Bible show us? What did we see in the Bible? When Paul and Silas were in shackles, they praised him and the shackles fell off. So I'm not waiting for him to do it for me to praise him. Praise him and he will do it. <laughs> I know that he will do it. What do you do? You see the secret behind the works of God. David says, I'm gonna stand and I'm gonna declare the works of God. The secret behind the works of God is that God does not do any works outside of his words. The Bible says that by him, by the word of God that was with God in the beginning, John chapter 1, in verse 3, he says, the Bible says he was in the beginning with God and by him all things were made and there was nothing made that was made without the word of God. And so if I am anticipatory of declaring a testimony, what do I do? I just declare the work of God. I declare the word of God. I declare the word of God. I declare the word of God. 
one of the things that I petition of the Lord is I say, Father, I know that we have been through quite a bit. We were dealt a bad hand. Many of what we were taught, things we were taught while we were growing up were actually not true. A lot of what is still being said in the world, a lot of what's in textbooks were put in textbooks just so as to continue to keep us bound and keep us, uh, what's the word? Um, keep us behind, keep us in prison. That's the word that I'm looking for. You see, because the people who handed us a lot of these things recognize that if only we, if we would know the truth, the truth sets us free. And the moment you're free, you are nobody's slave. You see what I mean? But there are families who woke up before we did and decided that they were going to keep the rest of us asleep. Keep us going to the grind again and again, chasing shadows rather than seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. So much premium has been put on the, on the pursuit of mammon over the pursuit of the presence of God. And so my desire lately has been constantly to seek the face of the Lord concerning freedom, concerning liberty. We need to be set free from certain things that we have become addicted to. We need to be set free from certain expectations that are unholy, that are unrighteous. Do you know that several people cannot even believe God for the more than abundant life directly? They have to first of all think that they have to get a particular kind of job and make a particular amount of money. Why are you setting up all these hurdles for yourself? When the Bible says Jesus came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The one who came to give you life, do you think is now going to be dangling the life over you? He says, no, it is all yours. And so we need to be free of mindsets. And so I was here worshiping God and I, just, I was just having a good, great time in God's presence. You know me? The moment I'm here, I don't wait for my feelings to lift me up. Because my feelings can only take me so far. So what do I do? I do what David did. You know, David says, this is the day the Lord has made. And that's all I need to know. He says, so I will rejoice. Praising God and rejoicing in God's presence is not a function of whether Ashley is singing or whether Stephen is singing. We thank God for the ministry of the minstrels. But praising God is a function of the decisions that I make in my heart. To say regardless of how hot it was in this room when we came in, I'm still gonna praise God. I may not be able to hug people as much as I want after because I'm all sweaty, but I'm gonna hug the Lord while I can. So what do I do? I come into God's presence, I throw myself into it. I sing more than, I try to out sing everybody around me. It's just one of those things that I do. I'm spiritually competitive, you see? So if you're standing next to me and I can hear your voice, we have, a, we have a problem. Why can I hear your voice? What happened to my voice? You understand what I mean? Simply because, let me tell you something, if the Lord Jesus were to show up in here, or you say that Jesus is going to be somewhere at 6 p.m. or 6.30, on your way, you will stop at Costco to buy him the finest gifts. And while you're there, you're picking up a can of coke and then you see Barbara she's pushing a trolley that has coke sprite peanut cashew nuts all those things what would you do you would say man I'm not gonna let Barbara outdo me before the Lord isn't that what we do you want to give your very best okay right from the beginning God has always expected our very best the guy who tried it with God initially he ended up badly remember Cain he saw Abel taking the best of his offerings. And he was like, I don't know. Who, who asked you to do all of that? And then he took whatever he could and God rejected his offering. So we have that thing written into us that we have to give the very best. And that is how I treat the presence of God. Whenever I know God is in the place, I want to give him my very best. I want to sing. I want to shout. And it works. Because when you throw yourself into his presence, he picks you up. And the Lord answered me while I was there. And he showed this to me. I saw angels in his presence. And then I saw me too. And I was laughing. I came close enough to hear the angels singing. The way they were shouting, they were making joyful noises in the presence of God. And you know, the Lord has already told us exactly what we need to do in this season to get the very best of him. Anyway, you're going to sit down in a moment. Let's just read this verse of scripture because I see people are already beginning to show me the move. Let us sit down. 
No, no, but seriously, the Lord showed us things that we need to do. When you come into my presence, you have to first of all believe that it is my presence because I said it is my presence. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. And he also said to us to make a joyful noise. Just about two weeks ago, I reminded all of you all that in, in Psalms chapter 66 verse 1, the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. In Psalms 80 verse 1, it says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Psalms 100, make a joy. Repeatedly in scripture, it, we kept seeing or we keep seeing make a joyful noise. So why wouldn't we make a joyful noise? Because when we make a noise, there is delivery. There are certain blessings that we cannot give birth to if we don't travail. The Bible says before Zion traveled, she brought forth. That is a kind of blessing. And the Bible says that as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth. So if you're missing certain blessings, they might just be blessings that require a big shout to come out. How many people here have seen a big baby born? Yeah, when Aria was born, she was like a little giant. She was almost 22 inches long and almost 11 pounds in size. When she came out, the first thing that I said was, oh, she just needs a dress. She's ready. But let me tell you something, it took a big shout to birth a big baby. Okay, very quickly, I said one verse of scripture, but we're just going to add two or three more to it just to make it more meaningful, more, more, more of a blessing. The Bible says in Psalms, so I'm going to read Psalms chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3 first of all, because that is what I've been teaching for like two years. The summary of a lot of what I've been teaching is that we have come to such a time that all the kings of the earth have banded themselves together against the Lord's anointed, against the church. All of the policies that have been made, all of the commotion that is in the world, the wars that have been fought, they are not being fought and they are not being done for the economy. They are being done against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible says. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. We carry the treasures of this life. Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish. So basically, if you don't believe in him and jump onto his ship, you are bound to perish because the earth itself is on its way to perishing. Okay? And so everything that is precious in this life or the only things that remain precious is the soul of the believer. And so that is the reason why they're coming after us. Now look at what he said here in verse 4. The Bible says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Wow. <laughs> the Bible says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. So if there is famine on earth and I am seated in the heavens, I shall laugh. If there is an outbreak of a disease, Jesus says, even though you are in this world, you are not of this world. The Bible says you, Josephine, you are seated in Christ Jesus. At the right hand of the Father. And what do they do, the ones who sit together with the Father? They laugh because they see that everything that has been plotted on the earth is called a vain thing. And that was what the Lord showed to me. I saw that expression on his face once again as he laughs and it became music in my heart. And the secret to the joy of the believer is to experience the smile on God's face. The moment you come close enough to see God laugh, it's over. Because if God is laughing, then why are you bothered? Have you not seen in movies where someone is afraid and they're panicking and they go to the strong man of the movie and the strong man started to laugh? Even the one that is crying starts to laugh too. <laughs> you must know something that I don't. So if it's funny, then maybe I need to laugh too. God knows something that you need to know. 
that is for you and not against you. Let's be seated. Praise the Lord. God is good. The one who sits in the heavens, he laughs. In the face of all, in the face of all of what has been plotted on the earth, he laughs. By the grace of God today, I want to talk to us a couple, about a couple of things. I will remind us, my wife came here and she reminded us of the, the, the power of coming close enough to the Lord Jesus Christ in his presence and laying hold of his robe. You know that last week I reminded us again that many people can only tell you about the train of his robe. Because when you see a bride from a distance and she has a dress with a train, you can see the train from a distance, but that doesn't mean you know the fragrance of the, of the robe. It doesn't mean you know the texture of the robe. It doesn't even mean that you get to attend whatever is going on. You're only looking from afar. But I don't want to worship from afar. I want to come close. And so the Lord's been inviting us to go beyond observing the train of his robe to actually come in to grab and lay hold of that robe itself. Because when you can lay hold of that robe, you shall be made whole. And so that's reminder number one. The other thing that I want to remind us of is... And I mentioned it a little bit already when I was talking about the kings of the earth plotting this and plotting that. It doesn't, we're not at a disadvantage when we are in Christ Jesus. Okay, because you can't be in the light and be in the dark at the same time. So the way the enemy has been planning to keep us subservient is also the way God has planned to make us kings and priests unto him. Okay, so it doesn't matter where you're at and the hand that you have been dealt. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, he said one thing. He said, if God the Father did not withhold Jesus from us, he said, will he not together with him freely give us all things? Think about it this way. The Bible says, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in him all things consist, and God has already given you Jesus. So the reason why we walk around feeling like we need this or we need that is because we're not as conscious as we should be of what we have already been given. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the primary reason why we break bread at communion house every meeting that we have. Because when certain disciples of Jesus Christ on the way to Emmaus for seven miles they walked for seven miles with the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and they did not recognize him. Jesus was giving them hints. And look, they just couldn't recognize who he was. In fact, they, were, they looked at him after a while. They were like, are you a stranger in this lens? Do you not know what's been going on? And Jesus was thinking to himself, what is going on around you is not what's important. It is what is going on within you. They were busy talking to Jesus about all of the chaos that was going on around them. And Jesus was like, wait a minute, what did I tell you before I left? I said, the kingdom of God is coming, but it's going to be within you. And as soon as he said that, you know what people said? They were like, oh, sorry, all that stuff you said was for you. For us, we want to see the kingdom around us. And Jesus was like, oh my goodness, if only these people know. The thief is still going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. Why should God bring the beauty of the new kingdom into a perishing world? So he said to them, nobody puts a new wine in an old sheep skin. In an old wine skin, you will destroy both of them. So what I'm going to do is I will renew you. Once you are renewed and you are born again, then I will inseminate within you the kingdom of God which is not what you eat or drink, but it is the righteousness, peace, and joy. We are too focused on what's going on around us, folks, particularly in this information age, because every piece of information that the devil wants to feed you is available at your fingertips. You want bad news? There's a lot of it out there. The moment your phone buzzes sometimes is bad news. I don't know about you, but I've tried to disable that thing several times, but it just never goes away. I've never received an amber alert 
that was telling me that someone was raised from the dead or that somebody who was ill has gotten up there's never been any good news is either someone's been kidnapped or someone's car is missing and I'm like okay there's no shortage of bad news around me so why do I even need to even pay attention you don't even have to pay attention bad news is so abundant and that is the reason why we need to start to pull ourselves back and begin to look inward because everything that we need is already inside of us I took my time to explain that because I want to share with you a vision that I saw and an experience that I had while we were praying as we were praying I started to speak in an unknown tongue in a tongue that I had never spoken in before and I thought to myself the first thing that I thought was wait a minute that sounds like somebody else and as soon as I said that sounded like somebody else the person who was speaking in tongues was revealed to me and it was me and I'm like okay this is interesting you know, because there are times wherein I've had visions and I've been in trances, I've had experiences wherein there will be a guide in the vision. Almost every vision that I have had has had a guide in it. Someone that I can ask questions to. What is this thing that I am seeing? Which is consistent with what you see in scripture when the prophets and when the men of God in scripture look at Apostle John, for example, all of that revelation, there was hardly anything that he saw without a guide that he could ask questions to. And so I've come to recognize that there are voices of other people that I would hear. But this particular one ended up being me. And the curious person that I am, I asked again, I said, how is this even possible? This guy looks stronger than me, yet older than me. He looked like he had gray hair, gray beard, but he was so much fitter. He didn't have this big belly that I'm hauling around. I took time to notice that he was a strong man, even though he was an older man. And you know what was said to me immediately? I had barely asked the question and the one who was my guide in the vision said to me he said have you forgotten that eternity is on the inside of you he said and you are what you know let me just explain that because I believe there is power in in understanding what God said when he says he has put eternity into the hearts of men let's take some mundane examples Many of us are familiar with medical practitioners and we call them doctors. Why do we call them doctors? We call them doctors because of what they know. Right? When you were a child, you were a child because of what you didn't know. As you grew older and you started to learn and to know things, you became an adult because of what you know. So what you know essentially determines your frame and determines to a very large extent who you are. Can I give you a more spiritual example then? Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If I come to you before you know the truth and I find you in chains and I break those chains, do you know that you still might not be free? Because you only start to do things you couldn't do before the moment you know that you are free. But what if you're free and you don't even know it? Do you know that when Jesus died, he died for the whole world? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son to die for the world, but only the people who come to know that truth by believing it walk in that freedom even though it's available for everybody so you are free only if you know that you are free and that is the reason why we need to press in to know more and more about who we are in Christ Jesus huh. folks everything that you've wanted to be is a function of what you need to know Many of us have always wanted to be mature enough in spiritual things to forgive without struggle. Because it takes spiritual maturity to forgive people. And for those people who haven't heard me teach on the subject, I'll take 90 seconds to quickly summarize the secret to forgiveness. When Jesus got his disciples, one of the very first things he told them was this, because they were arguing amongst themselves that how many times can somebody really offend me before it's too much? And Jesus was like, you want to know? He said to them, 70 times 7. And what is 70 times 7? About 490 times. 
Now, if anyone is offending you repeatedly for 490 times in a day, then that means you are the problem. Because why would you even stay there and let them keep offending you? Go somewhere else. Jesus is saying, Jesus said to them, 70 times 7, and you will forgive them. And they were like, okay, we can handle that. Yeah? And then the next thing Jesus said to them was this. So the first thing is, if they offend you and they come to ask for forgiveness, forgive them. And then the next thing is, Jesus said, look, even if they don't have for forgiveness, the moment you think that there might be a bad blood between both of you, Jesus said, if you think that there might be an ought, ought means the tiniest thing that can ever be. He says, if there is an ought between both of you, he says, go to them and just let them know that, look, I forgive you. Then that is maturity level number two. Maturity level number three was Jesus said to them, when somebody offends you, there's no need to forgive them if you don't take offense. Right? And so instead of saying, oh, I used to struggle to forgive people. Then I got better. After a while, I can forgive them after two years. After a while, I can forgive them after two days. Some people still have to sleep over it. But that is the flesh. Your spirit doesn't have to sleep over it because it doesn't even sleep in the first place. So stop being in the flesh, being in the spirit, and then you can forgive immediately. In fact, when you're in the spirit, you can forgive people ahead of time. There are certain people that God has allowed me to forgive ahead of time, even before they wronged me, because God showed to me that they were going to wrong me. Do you think while Jesus was on the cross, he was contemplating whether to forgive Judas is carried or not? No. Before Judas betrayed Jesus, Jesus already knew. A lot of the reason why we struggle to forgive people and to love on people is because people do things that we cannot comprehend. You keep saying, how can a person even think of doing that? How can a person even do that? And because you're so shocked, then you start to misbehave because when we're startled, we're not ourselves. But what if you are walking in the spirit and you already see ahead of time the one that will betray you? The one that will offend you at work on Monday if you have already seen it. When they come and they say the foolishness that they say, you're like, is that it? God bless you. Simply because you are not shocked. You've had enough time to be able to consider exactly how to handle it. So there are several maturity levels when it comes to dealing with people and we need to understand these things because the Bible says follow peace with all men and holiness with that which no man shall see God. Holiness is being like God. God says be holy as I am holy. What is the meaning of holiness? Holiness means a character that is pure and undefiled. So God is pure and undefiled in his character. He's full of integrity. He's a faithful God. He never fails. Whatever he says, he does it. And he wants you to be like that. He wants you to have to be at the crux of character. And so if you don't follow peace with all men and you are not following holiness with God, you cannot see him. He's not going to let you in because he's too holy to behold sin. And unforgiveness is sin. So that is the reason why we need to learn how to deal with people. Otherwise, some people have made up their minds that they will not go to hell alone. They want to take you with them. We know that about Satan, right? Satan already knows he's going to hell. Because when they sinned, they were already eternal beings. So they were stuck in that state forever. When we sinned, God gave us the privilege as human beings to die and then be raised again and we now say we're born again. Right? That was the reason why after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in disobedience to God, God said to his angel, don't let them go near the tree of life. And we used to think that God was punishing them. No, he was saving them from eternal damnation. Because after having sinned, if they had eaten of the tree of life, then they will live forever in a sinful state and there will be no redemption. And that was why God quickly drove them out of the garden and put his angel there with a flaming sword because he doesn't want them to be lost forever. He told them, go out there for the meantime until the Savior comes. And that was why Job said, all the days of my vain life, I will wait until my Redeemer comes. So here is the deal, y'all. We are very privileged as human beings because we have the opportunity to die and then be raised unto newness of life. But some spirits, some beings who sinned while they were already eternal beings, 
They don't want to go there alone. And so that's why they're here recruiting people to help them fight at least. They want to try one more time to see if they can defeat Jesus. The Avengers. They're trying to try again. But here is the deal, y'all. We know one thing. That Satan makes disciples of certain men. And Satan does not have his own playbook. What he does is he gets God's playbook and reads it backwards. So if Jesus made disciples, Satan makes disciples. If Jesus is taking people into eternal life, Satan wants to take people into eternal damnation. And so some people have already been recruited by Satan. So the way that I labor over you with love, waking up in the middle of the night to pray, to study, to hear the voice of God, that is the same way some people somewhere are waking up in the middle of the night and casting spells and exes and, and, and fasting so that they can have spiritual powers with which to pull you into hell. Where did they learn that from? Because God has watchmen upon the towers who are praying all through the night so that you will not fall into temptation. God is raising people who are seeking the face of God all the time, fasting and praying and saying, God, what are you saying to your people? What are you saying? What is the word for the body today? Because we live and move and have our being in Christ Jesus, in the word of God. So if we don't have the word for now, we're crippled. So we need the word because without the word, we cannot move. It is the lamp unto our feet. And if we don't have that illumination, we don't know where to go, what to do. Jesus says those who try to walk in the darkness, they stumble. So the way some people are seeking the face of God, for you, there are certain people who are aligning with Satan on your behalf. Don't let them drag you with them because they will come in the form of offenses. And do you know what's interesting is that Satan likes to use people that God has used because he's seen them in action. And he's like, oh my God. I don't even have to go and do my own recruiting. I can just steal this person. Jesus was the one that recruited Judas. But Satan was the one that hired him eventually. Jesus was the one with all the discernment. He went and he recruited the twelve. And they were supposed to be his team. And Judas was on that team. Do you know that Jesus was, Judas was Jesus' treasurer. He was a member of Jesus' board. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that he was the treasurer. He was the one... I mean, for you to be trusted with money, you must have proven yourself again and again. And Satan was like, okay, I'll see this one. He's already trusted. So when I, if I need somebody to get close to Jesus, I would have to use the one that is trusted. Do you know that Judas was actually truly one of the people closest to Jesus? When they sit down to eat, he would sit next to Jesus. How do I know that? When Jesus' feet was being washed with the, with the oil from the alabaster box, some people who were standing in the back could not have seen what was going on. Remember that Jesus did not live in America. You know, in America, all of our houses are big. Where he lived, the houses were small. There are like 5,000 people outside and 1,500 inside, all crowded. So for you to see that his feet was being washed, you have to have been there with nobody between you and him. And he was like, oh, this is a waste. And look at all the oil, you see oil everywhere. He was that close. When Jesus was to be crucified, was to be betrayed, and he prophesied again about his betrayal, John the Beloved was like, you keep speaking about somebody betraying you. Who is that person? Jesus was like the one who dips his bread in my cup. You must be a superhero from Marvel to be able to stretch forth your hand from one room to the next to deep bread. Judas was sitting next to Jesus. So he was the perfect candidate from Satan's perspective. Satan does not use strangers to hurt you. The Bible says a man's enemies are those of his household. He uses people that are close to you. People that you have opened up your heart to. Because that makes his work very easy. Do you think if some random fellow showed up in the garden of Gethsemane, the first thing Jesus would think about doing was giving him a hug. Hey, yo, buddy. No. Satan knew that that was not going to work. So he found Judas' carrier. And as soon as Judas showed up, even though Judas showed up with a battalion of soldiers, 
Jesus still gave him a hug because that was his boy. But it's okay. Because your light is not to be overshadowed by darkness. It is the darkness that has to flee when your light shines. The devil tries to use intimidation to stop us from getting up. Because he knows that we're light. The moment we get up, we shine. It's just by default. So that's why he wants to keep you down with all kinds of offenses. He wants to keep you down with all kinds of grudges and unholy expectation. Satan wants to restrict your liberty. You know, like I said last week, the Bible says the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It wasn't even last week, it was Tuesday that I was teaching about the meaning of Moab. We are supposed to be Moab. Moab means like the Father. And God expects us to be like Him. And if the Lord is that spirit and He brings liberty wherever He goes, you are supposed to bring liberty, take liberty wherever you go. But some people, they bring restriction everywhere they go. You may have been having great fellowship and having a great time together. The moment they come and they start gossiping, backbiting, then people lose their liberty. You used to be able to come into fellowship and not think that anyone is judging you, but because she's come to tell you that, oh, do you know that these people are talking about you? Then she takes away your freedom. The next time you walk into fellowship, you start walking like a zombie because you don't want, to, you don't want anyone to judge the way you're walking. Some people want to take away your liberty. But you should not let them. Keep being the child of God that you are. Keep doing what your heavenly father has asked you to do. Because every time you get up, the light just shines. You know, the Bible says, arise, shine. The Bible does not say arise and shine. Because that would mean is, when I rise, then I have to decide if I want to shine or not. No, light cannot decide by itself if it wants to shine or not. It just shines. The moment you have a candle, it just shines. You don't light a candle and then hold the remote control and now say, shine. No, if you don't want it to shine, you'd have to cover it. But the moment it's open up, it shines. That is the reason why Satan is after your freedom, after your liberty. He doesn't want you to speak on social media because of the trolls. Because the last time you made a comment on someone's post, they came after you. Because they want to shut you down. Because every time you open your mouth, God is glorified. So they want you to stop speaking. My friends, do not stop speaking. We are too powerful for Satan. And he wants to shut us up. David said, in silence, my bones grew weak within me. So we need to, we need to keep speaking. Okay, now let's go because I know there's a lot of rabbit trailing today, but I want to show you something real quick. But before I show it to you, let me just quickly finish what I was saying about the vision that I saw. So when I heard myself speak, and it was a different language and it was a different voice, the one who was my guide in the vision asked if I, had, if I remembered that the Lord has put eternity on the inside of man. And he said to me, he said, that is just another version of you from another time within eternity. So Antoine, the grace of God is available to every single one of us to be able to time jump. So if there's anything that I'm struggling with today, it might be addiction, it might be undue indulgence. That is the me, the version of me of today. But by the word of God that spells out eternity, I can take a giant leap into my future self that is more mature and experience victory over that oppression. Because some of the demons that are tormenting you today, let's say in the next 1500 years, they would have been bound in hell and they won't be able to trouble you anymore. So imagine if you can just see the version of yourself hundreds of years from now. Now you can't imagine it because you think, oh man, most times we're like 90, 80, maybe 100 years and we die. No, the Bible says that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we live forever. There is a version of you that is eternal and you can have access to that eternal power that is within you. That is not the part that gets me the most excited. The part that gets me the most excited is the version of me that existed before that angel fell and became the lieutenant of Satan. Which means 
if I can just go back in time far enough to a time wherein I existed in the mind of God before that evil was invented then that means they are subject to me because lesser spirits have to bow to higher spirits that is the order of things that was what Jesus practiced and he told them because when they came to Jesus and they were like well by what wisdom does he do these things they gave us a clue we know that because wisdom was the first spirit wisdom existed before all things Proverbs chapter 8 wisdom said to Solomon he says before the Almighty began his creation he possessed me he says I have been with the Almighty right from the beginning of his ways so everything that was made after was subject and remains subject to the wisdom of God and that's why the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing wisdom is the school principle wisdom is the one that everybody bows to and so when they saw demons bowing to Jesus they were like no this has to be wisdom because remember that they were Jews and they knew that Solomon spoke to demons and they knew that he did that because of the wisdom that God gave to him he was not intimidated by evil spirits because he's, he knew that there was nothing they could do to him you know the Bible says if God be for us who can be against us you see when you begin to recognize these things now what gave, what gave me the boldness to speak as I spoke in the vision that I saw what gave me the boldness was who I was and how did I become that person by what I knew we need to know God we need to seek to know him and the Bible says God is love we need to just continually pursue love Every example that I have given you so far today about forgiving people, about addictions, about all of those things, none of them can stand in the face of pure love. Can I explain something to you real quick? The Bible says that in the last days, men shall become lovers of pleasure, lovers of themselves, more than they are lovers of God. Why? What did you read before that statement? The Bible says, in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. So there is no way I would love some substance more than I love my life. Let me, let me say this again slowly. There are certain things that we engage in and we know that they are destructive. Now forgiveness is destructive. When you are not friends, with, when you were friends with people and then you stop being friends with them, it's not healthy until you are forgiven and release them every time you see their picture or they pass by or they mention their name or Facebook does the evil thing that it does or bringing back memories uh, remember that I told you that bad news is everywhere you don't even have to look for it it finds you sometimes sometimes you wake up and you just want to bless the Lord, oh bless the Lord, oh my soul. And then you pick up your phone and there's this Facebook memory of you and your arch enemy high-fiving each other at Disney. And then you see that picture and then you're like, mm. yeah. And it says two years ago and then you're like, blood of Jesus. And then you swipe it off. And then the next thing you see is the person that you just heard is speaking bad about you in a picture where they were standing next to you in fellowship and both of you were worshiping God and you're like evil people and then you keep scrolling you see there is peace when we're at peace I said that backwards I'm just making sure you're paying attention we're at peace when there is peace you see if there is peace between you and somebody you're at peace and so if you want to always be at peace, then be at peace. If you reach out to them and they don't reach out to you, the Bible says find a friend. Let somebody talk to them. And after that, you're released. The Bible says follow peace with all men. You are peacemakers, you're not peacekeepers. Many of us, because we're afraid of what will happen, if we lose that peace, then we start compromising. You don't tell the truth to people. No, I'm not afraid to make peace. I'm not afraid to tell people the honest truth. And then if they get offended, I will reach out to them and say, oh, are you angry because of what I said? I will say it again, it was the Lord. So come on, repent. You understand what I mean? Yeah, because I'm trying to do you a favor here. 
Oh yeah. And then sometimes it's like, man, I yeah, yeah, you're afraid because of what, what I did. Oh, I'm sorry. I I was trying to be here early. It's just I just didn't get here. So just get over it. I mean, I'm here anyway. You know, because some people when you're 30 minutes late, they will make you feel so bad like you just killed somebody. You understand what I mean? No, I was trying. I was really trying. It was just that that belt didn't fit. And I had to turn back as soon as I got to 85 because I'm like, that food is good and I don't want this belt on the way. You know, but people just look at you because that's not what they will do. And then they try to sour the peace. No, I'm a peacemaker. I will make peace. I'm not a peacekeeper. A peacekeeper is the person that compromises to make sure that other people are the way they are. No, I don't mind roughing a couple of feathers if that gets us to be where we need to be. Okay? I, I wasn't planning to say that, so maybe that's a nugget for somebody. Stop being a peacekeeper. Peacekeeping is too much compromise. Peacemaking is good. You might have to go to war, but then at the end of the day, you see, I'm not in a hurry to be friends with anybody because I know that I'm eternal being. Alrighty, whether I hear there or in the air, you and I will still get together and we'll be friends. But for now, I am fighting the war of peace, which means I say no to compromise. I will tell you the truth and let the devil be ashamed. Alrighty, so anyway, that version of that man that I saw was because of what he knows. Let me, let me explain this from another angle and then we will close. You see, let's read it. I think if we read a story, an actual story, we'll be able to understand and appreciate this thing better. Come with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Second Samuel, the second book of Samuel chapter 9. Samuel, the name of God. Alrighty. So, God is love. The knowledge that I need to have is the knowledge of God. Is to have an experiential knowledge of his love. Because the more I know him, the more I'm able to walk in love. And when I walk in love, my light shines and darkness has to flee. Folks, the Bible says by wisdom a house is built. By understanding it is established. And by knowledge it is filled with all precious things. We are filled with knowledge. So the shape that we take is a function of the knowledge that we have. So we need to do what? We need to pursue the knowledge of the things of God so that we can access various versions of us in the timeline of God's goodness in order to be able to overcome adversity. These things are very critical, very important for us to know. Let me tell you something. Many of us worry about things that haven't happened. And after they have happened, you don't worry as much. In fact, do you know many things that you have feared? After they happened, you realize that actually, you know what? It's a good thing that it happened. I'm better off for it. I remember that there was this friend that I had. And he would behave very badly every now and again. But I was like, man, I like me some him. So I'm just going to keep make, keeping peace. I was keeping peace and keeping peace. And after a while, I'm like, one day he just called me and he started to say nonsense again. So I shut him down. And after I shut him down, guess what? He wouldn't call me again. I messaged him. I was like, hey, yo, you doing okay? I saw you and your daughter doing this and that. And he, he didn't respond. So I'm like, okay, so he's cut me off officially. Now, the reason why I was keeping peace initially was because I was afraid of losing him as a friend. But then after I spoke the truth to him, and he took the position that he took. Then it became apparent to me that, oh, actually, at the end of the day, he was not even my tribe. I was being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. He didn't believe in the grace of God like I believe in the grace of God. He didn't believe in the art of commitment one to another because the Bible says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And so the entire time I was just carrying a burden. Like I told you, 
People don't want to see you rise because they feel like they are stuck where they're at. So they want to pull you down with them in sadness, in gossip, in all kinds of backward behavior. After he cut me off, that was when I realized that, well, thank you, Lord Jesus. Now I don't have to put up with two hour conversations of nonsense. One in the name of I'm just trying to be nice. Like I told you, the moment I noticed that niceness is not the fruit of the Spirit, I decided I was no longer going to try to be nice. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. The reason why I will smack my little man sometimes is because I know if he doesn't get smacked now, he will think that is good behavior. That is kindness. But niceness is to say, oh, I don't want to hurt his little feelings. No, I need to hurt that little feeling. Because that little feeling does not belong in my child. The Bible says in the heart of a little child, foolishness is bound. And the rod of correction is needed. I'm not saying go get a plank from home, home people to whack your child. The rod of correction simply means correction that is extended. Okay? What is rod of correction? Correction that is extended. Some of us think correction in our minds of what we should tell our children, but we don't extend it to them. And the Bible says that love, that open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. If I say that I love you and I don't want to hurt your feelings, the Bible says that's not my kind of love. God kind of love is what? He's got rod and staff. So with the rod, I extend correction to you. And with the staff that is curved, I pull you back in. If you didn't know that's what rod and staff is. In fact, for me, me, I didn't know it for several years. I had to ask the Holy Spirit one day. I said, I've looked at the meaning in the dictionary and they almost mean the same thing in the hand of a shepherd. And then he took me to the green pastures and he showed me the rod and the staff. The rod is straight, very pointed, very direct. When I'm correcting my children, I don't meander. No, 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 I'm direct because it's a rod. But then later on, I find my staff. You know, the staff is very curved. The staff is what the shepherd uses to pull sheep out of a hole. So it has to be curved. And that is the reason why I will come around them sometimes and say, okay, okay, I know you feel bad. But what I'm saying is still the truth. Though. Come around, I'll, I'll buy you something. You understand what I mean? So that is rod and staff. Okay? And it comforts. The Bible says your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I was setting y'all up. Let me tell you the three things that I just told you that you didn't even know. I just told you what you find in God's presence. You find love. You find boldness. And you find instruction in righteousness. These three things would allow for you to stand your ground in these evil times. Now let me show you somebody in the Bible who was missing all of these things. Psalm, 2 Samuel chapter 9. The Bible says, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Recently, very, very recently, in fact, even today, while I was kneeling here, the Lord showed to me that I wasn't David, that I was him. The Bible says that God, the eyes of God, runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for that man whose mind is stayed on him. God said when David went out, he said, I just wanted that to be an outward demonstration of what I do on the daily basis. I'm looking for somebody in the house of Saul, for Jonathan's sake, that I can bless. God is looking for good people. God is looking for people who are loving. God is looking for people who will open their hearts to the Lord in generosity, in kindness. People who are holy as he is holy. People who will choose others over themselves in godly service. David came out and he was looking. He says, is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? The word Jonathan means the gift of God. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called to him, just make note of that name, Ziba. So when they had called 
him to David, excuse me, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. Then the king said, is there still not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, the kindness of God? Then they said, well, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in the feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said, king, said to the king, indeed he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. And uh, for, let's get to where the name of this person is because his name is critical. Verse 5 says, Then the king sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, is that you? And he answered, it is your servant. Folks, I told you that Satan wants as many of us to go to hell with him as possible. And how does he do that? He does that by introducing idols into our lives. And what are idols? Idols are made of stone because God keeps referring to these idols as being made of stone. Idols are made of stone. Everywhere you look, you find that all of the civilizations before us a lot of what is left of them is not the good works that they did but it's the idols and the pillars and the columns that they put up the stones that they keep making sacrifices to because if satan can put stone in your heart then you become too heavy for lift off it is the will of God for you to be filled with the spirit because spirit is wind. When you're filled with the spirit, what happens? You rise out of the water. This life is water. And so the only people that will make it out of the water when the flood of God's judgment comes are the ones who have the buoyancy. And what is that buoyancy? That buoyancy is having peace with man and holiness unto the Lord. You need to be light-bodied in your heart. So Satan is like, I'm going to get some idols in there. Pride is an idol. Unforgiveness is an idol. Self-seeking is an idol. Not loving God and loving men is an idol. And all of these things, the key to breaking the power of idolatry over your life is very simple. God told us in the commandments. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your might. Remember that scripture that I read to you earlier? That the love of many will wax cold and then they will become lovers of themselves and lovers of pleasure, lovers of money. The reason why people become lovers of themselves, the reason why people get addicted to drugs, they love those substances and the pleasure that it gives to them. The reason why some people are addicted to chasing money, no amount of money they make is enough. The reason why they become lovers of money is because they have lost their love for God. The Bible says it, the love of many will wax cold. The reason why I need to love God, to be honest, sometimes is because if I do not love God, I am going down. Because only the love of God has the ability and the power to lift and to save. For God so loved the world that he gave, that they might be saved. An idol is what will make any one of us sink. And that is the reason why this guy's name is very important. The guy's name is what? Mephibosheth. The word Mephibosheth means the destroyer of idols. Mephibosheth means the one that destroys idols. But guess who Mephibosheth was living with? Guess the person who knew everything about Mephibosheth. The person that he was connected to. His name was Ziba. And Ziba means idol. When God is looking to bless you, guess who responds in your name? The idols. David was looking for a man who is from the lineage of Saul. And Ziba, who was not even connected to them, he just happens to have been an employee when Saul was around. And he showed up. And David was like, no, I'm not looking for you. I'm looking for someone who is of the household of 
because they knew that all his children had died. And so David was looking for someone who was somehow connected, maybe a grandson. Let me tell you something, every time there is an idol in your heart, it responds to try to snatch the blessing of God that is coming in your name. And that is the reason why God says, if you are holding on belief in your heart, don't ask God for anything because the loving God that he is, he will not give it to you. Because if he gives to you what you're asking for while you are in unbelief, while you are in unforgiveness, the idol of unbelief, the idol of unforgiveness is called Ziba and Ziba will take your blessing. And God is like, no, why you're still harboring idols in your heart? The idol in your heart is what makes you to look down on other people. The Lord is saying, no, I'm not going to give you. When God says, I'm not going to give something to you, it's not because he hates you. No, he cannot even hate you. He is love. He's loved you with an everlasting love. No matter what you do, he doesn't stop loving you. But he has his rules and that is what they are. To protect you. He said, my thought toward you are not of evil, but they are of hope. To give you a future and a hope. I'm God, I live in eternity. I don't have a future. I am the future. But you need to grow. And I want you to grow healthily. That is the reason why Ziba does not belong in your heart. Because Ziba would answer every time I want to bless you. Do you know that there are people here that God wants to bless financially, but because there is an idol in your heart that is going to make you spend every one of those money oppressing and impressing other people. And God is like, no, I didn't make you to cover them with more darkness. They're already blinded by the cares of this world. I've called you to be light. We have an expression where I come from. When you bring out very shiny objects, when you bring out things to impress other people, you say, we're going to blind them. We used to say that. In fact, sometimes it still comes out of me. You see what I mean? But in reality, God did not call me to blind anybody. He's called me to open the eyes of the blind. So as long as I have the idol of oppression in my heart, the blessing is not going to come because if it comes, Ziba will take it. And so God shut down Ziba. What I want you to take from here today is not just that. I want you to also remember where Mephibosheth was found. The reason why Mephibosheth could not overcome Ziba, the reason why he could not destroy the idols was because he was lame. And where was he found? He was found in a place that is called Lo Debar. What does Lo Debar mean? Lo, the word Lo means not. Debar means pasture or green pasture, Debar. He was found in not a pasture. Wow, no surprises here. Because when you are not in the Lord's presence, when you have not allowed the good shepherd to have access to you, to nurture you and to cater to you, because the word of the Lord came to you and it was strong as a rod of correction, you ran away from the presence of God. When, when you went to God's presence, God told you, you need to go and forgive Alan. And you're like, I'm not forgiving Alan. And you decided to run away from the presence of God. You separate yourself from the pasture of God where he nurtures you in his love and strengthens your bones. Now you have become a feeble Seth. You are struggling to overcome idols because you have left the pasture. Mephibosheth needs strength in his legs, but he was in low debar. He was in a place of deprivation. Solomon says, do not hurry from the presence of, of the king. Why must you stand in an evil place? Every time God tries to correct us and we run in the other direction, in fact, some of us don't even wait until God corrects us. The moment you hear about what God is doing in, in a particular church, you decide you're not going there. Because you're like, man, I don't want them to call me out. Some people have been invited to the communion house once before and they're like, oh, I hear that, you know, God's gifted you with the prophetic at communion house and your pastor can just call people and tell them what they ate for lunch. I'm not coming. Now, why don't you want to come? Is there something you're hiding from God? Oh, yeah, because sometimes even while I am preaching, I'm not even saying that I'm prophesying. God inspires me to say things that some people are going through and they get angry with the friend who invited them. They said, oh, you could have told me you already told the pastor my story. No, nobody told me nobody's story. But God knows you and the reason why he's exposing it is because if he doesn't expose Zipa, Zipa will take your blessing. Do you notice that when they asked Zipa if there was anybody left, Zipa pretended like he didn't know. It was other people who said, no, forget Zipa. 
there is Mephibosheth and we know where he's at. I want to encourage you folks, you need to leave Lodabar and go back to Bethel. You need to go back to the presence of God because that is where there is nurturing for your soul. That is when he gets to feed you. Solomon, I mean, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and he restores my soul. He leads me beside the still waters. Why? For his name's sake. That was why God said that wasn't just David. He said, that was me. He said, because I'm looking for a man to bless for Jonathan's sake. For his name's sake, he's looking for you to bless you. But these idols are keeping you away. I know that I've technically preached three sermons in one, but I'm going to tell you how they're all related and we're going to pray. We all need the presence of God because in the presence of God is where we have the fullness of the life of God. And that fullness of the life of God is in the form of the love of God. And the more we love him, the more we know him. That knowledge is what gives us the power to become who we need to be in the face of adversity. While I was in the presence of God, I was taken in the spirit and I found an older version of myself, even though older, yet stronger. And he spoke with much authority. The last conversation that I had with the one who was my guide in the vision was this. Let me tell you something. I come in here and you see me screaming and shouting and, and rolling on the floor and kneeling down and doing all that gymnastics. I'm not doing it to impress anybody. Nobody can see me the moment I'm kneeling down after all. But I do it because I know the secret to being in his presence is that when you are that close, you see things, you hear things, and then more importantly, you become things. I want to encourage you if you think you can worship God like that by just showing up and only worshiping God when we're in church it's going to take you a long time you have every day of the week at home on your own you know sometimes we haven't even started the first song and Alan is already like and it's like you're sitting in the back and you're like, slow down, man. They haven't even started. Well, he started before he got here. You understand what I mean? And that is the secret behind it. The secret behind it is to continue to persevere in his presence all day long. Because that is when, that is where all the transformation happens. You want to speak with authority such that those forces that are troubling you will let you be. And you're saying, well, I'm pretty, I'm good. I'm living a great life. I don't know what these forces you're talking about. You people are too conscious of enemy situations. Let me tell you something. The fact that you think that you are good is indicative of the fact that you cannot see. Because Jesus said, as long as you are in this world, <laughs> he says you will have tribulations and trials. So if you're not having tribulations and trials, that means the devil doesn't consider you a threat. Or maybe he's already troubling you, but he put on you a VR headset and you think you're in a garden, whereas you're on a cross somewhere and he's poking you with swords. You all know what I'm saying. There are seasons in our lives when we feel so much at ease, everything is going on well, so you think. And then suddenly, it's like the tables flip. And you're like, where did all these things come from? No, they were there the entire time. They were just waiting for you to wake up from your illusion. Solomon, in all his splendor, you know what he said? He said, God has placed man under the sun all the days of his life that he may be tested. That he may be exercised. Every day we have been tested. Even when you're sitting in that office with air conditioning and you know that your salary is guaranteed even if you do no work because of the kind of contract that you sign, your thoughts are still going in filthy places. We are at war. Money in your bank account doesn't mean that you are not at war. Don't wait until you're broke before you call. Before you phone home. Because if you wait till you're broke before you phone home, you might find yourself eating the food of pigs before they answer the phone. Let us learn to worship God. Okay, we're going to break bread. Let's uh, read Psalms 44 and then we're going to rise up and break bread. Psalms 
Psalms 144, every zebra, every idol of stone that is in our lives have to go. We would expel them in the name of Jesus and by the love of our Heavenly Father. Okay, this is what we have in Psalms 44 verse 7. Look at what it says. It says, but you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. So if you're still thinking that there are no enemies, the Bible says it is God that saves you from your enemies. So if he hasn't saved you from the enemy, you have enemies, you just do not know it yet because you're still blinded by the pleasures of this life. You need him to save you and for him to save you, his staff has to be able to reach you. And where is the staff going to reach you exactly where you were when he gave you that last instruction that you shied away from? This is a call to repentance, folks. It's a call to go back home and give somebody a call. It is a call to go back home and throw out those idols. It is a call. Let us rise up and break bread. And I'll share a quick testimony with you all. When I was in my first year at the university, there were certain things that I did not care for because I was quite a geek and so I didn't care for certain material things. But when I got to the university and I saw people wearing these fancy shoes, there was this particular pair of moccasins that people wore, you know, with twisted leather. And you know, he's like, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, look at the shoe that he's wearing. He knows what I'm talking about. He's pretty fly. And so when I got to school and I saw people wearing those things, I decided that I was going to save money to buy. And the one that I wanted to buy was the most expensive one there is. Don't even ask me where I got an idea from that I had to go all the way. I guess if people have been doing it and you're late to the game, you have to kind of like blind them. You see what I mean? So I was saving, I was saving, I was saving. And I, have, I had saved, I think it was about equivalent of about $600. And I had saved about $400. And so I was feeling on top of the world. I was like, the next time I get that stipend and I do this and do that, I'm going to have the full money that I need. And I sat in an evening service like this, first year at the university. Now, remember, okay, maybe you don't remember because you were not there, but I tell you, that particular season in my life, I was suffering from blindness of destiny. I knew that God has a future for me that I had seen before I went into that university, but I just couldn't see the wall that was in front of me. I knew that I was blind to the immediate future. And I had prayed, I had sought the Lord, I had even fasted and nothing was opening up. And I was like, oh, this is not nice. I don't want to fly blind. I know what God asked for me. I knew I was in that university for three years. It was a five-year program, but I went there to drop out, not to finish. Okay, hear me and hear me well. If God hasn't shown you stuff like that, don't just jump out and say, oh, because hey, you dropped out, I'm going to drop. If you drop out when God says not to drop out, you might be left out. But I knew what God had shown me. But what was going to happen in the immediate next step, I couldn't tell. And time was fleeting by. But I was saving money for a pair of moccasins. And so I sat there and there was this man of God who came into town and he was like, I want you all to give a sacrificial offering. And I'm like, okay, keep going. And then when he kept talking, I was not, after a while I switched off, I wasn't hearing him anymore. Because anybody that would touch my savings for the moccasins, I don't want to hear it. I shut it all out. But then I was hearing a louder voice from the inside. And the Lord asked me a question, he says, what is in your hand? <laughs> I was like, absolutely nothing. And he was like, no, you have something. And I said to the Lord, if you're coming after my moccasins, you're not having it. And he, and he said to me, he said, but I have what you need. And I was like, oh, you're not going to do me like that. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I really wanted those moccasins. As my wife stepped out, yes. Because there was this particular girl in fellowship. And I thought once I had that moccasins, it was over. How shallow. Yeah, I was very shallow. I was very vain. I thought that was what it took. What did I know? Like I told you, what you know determines who you are. So I was ignorant because I did not know. But somehow the Holy Spirit persuaded me to do the right thing. So I took a piece of paper as the offering basket was coming and I pledged my $400 so that the next time we come for service, I will bring that money from where I was hiding it. I was hiding it even from God. If you saw where I put it in my room, no one could find it. So I brought that thing. You know, the Bible says, they that go sowing 
weeping, bearing precious seeds will doubtless return with a harvest. I put that money in the offering bowl the next service. Ladies and gentlemen, I went home and it was almost as if the wall in my little room had fallen out. The first thing I started to see was another image of me. I saw an image of me that burst up and it was taller than the building that I was living in. And then joy started to come to my heart. Hope was renewed within me. Because I'm like, if I can see these things, then I can see the other things that I've been seeking God for. But guess what had to go? The idol. I was, I was in the temple of the God of Moccasins. He was getting the best of me. I was thinking about it all the time because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But the moment the idol left, I received the blessing of God. So as we break bread today, I want you to pray for God to reveal to you the ziba that may be in your life. Every single one of us at every stage in our life, in our lives, there's always something that needs to go. Because if everything that needs to go has already gone, then you will not be here. We saw men who emptied out everything within them and God took them. Enoch, God took him. Elijah, God took him. Because those guys breathing air on planet Earth would now become a waste from heaven's perspective because they were, there was nothing else. They were emptied. But while we're still here, that means there's something to fulfill. And while there is something to fulfill, you have been tested. And the reason why you have been tested is because there are idols at every level that are hidden. You just need to find yours for that level, get rid of it and go higher. So pray that the Lord will open your eyes to see, to see the enemies that you do not know so that he can help you overcome them. If he overcomes them for you and you did not even know you had enemies, how would you appreciate him? How would you learn? How would you know? And so just say, Father, whatever it is that I love more than I love you, I'm ready to let it go. Help me to let it go. Wherever my love for you has gone cold, bring your fire once again and help me to love you. Now listen to this. The Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. If we ask for him to shine that light, then the coldness of our hearts will melt and we will love him again as we should. At the moment we start to love him, then we will stop to love things. We will stop to become, we will stop becoming prisoner to things. And the idols that have stolen all of our blessings and the ones that are waiting to steal more will be rendered ineffective in our lives. So for his name's sake, he will bless you. But you need to love him. You need to grow in that love. So we're going to break bread with this particular scripture. I give us Psalms 47, 44 verse 7, but while I was talking, I think that one went cold. Let's find another one real quick. So come with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says, finally, this is first epistle of Peter, chapter 3, verse 8. It says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. He says, love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. If our hearts are hard toward other men, then they can never be soft toward God. God says, how can you say you love me, the invisible God that you have not seen when you do not love your brother and your neighbor that you see? Say, Father, I want to love as you love. I want to feed others in your love because we all are fed in God's pasture so when you feed others with love you bring yourself into his pasture and when you're in his pasture you're strengthened to get rid of the idol so just say Lord I want to love like you love so now let us receive the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and drink of his blood Jesus said this is my body when he held up the bread and he said this is my blood when he held up the wine and we are doing the same today in remembrance of him using his own words so this is the body of Jesus that was broken for me as I eat of it today 
I eat unto life. I eat unto newness of life. This is the blood of Jesus that was shed for me. As I drink of it today, I drink unto wholeness because his blood was his life. And we do all this today in remembrance of him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may eat and drink. Praise the Lord. In the few minutes that we have left, I want to quickly pray for some people. And I want to pray for you from the same second Samuel that we just read. Finally, Mephibosheth was found. And where was Mephibosheth? Where was he found? Mephibosheth was found in a place that was called Lodibar. Now let me show you something that I skipped earlier on. And if you will come to me to verse 4 that we just read. This is what God wants to deliver some of us from. And Mephibosheth was found in the house of a man that was called Machir. The word Machir is essentially of the same origin as the word merchant. It means to sell. So Mephibosheth was in a place called the house of Machir, where he was sold. Many of us were the ones who sold ourselves because of the cares of this life, because of fear. We sold ourselves to certain principalities and powers. We sold ourselves to certain situations. And we feel guilty within us that we have compromised all the goodness of God, the gift of eternal life that he has given to us. Because remember, Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, the son of the gift of God. And so today I wanna to pray for those folks in here who say, that they genuinely repent from every compromise. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. The truth is what makes you free. So the moment you sell the truth and you compromise, you find yourself in the house of material bound because you sold the truth. And so you're saying, Lord, I repent for every compromise that led me here. Lord, only you can save me from the idols that I have allowed in. Now we're in a moment of deliverance here. And so you don't have to have hands laid on you where you're at because the Lord's angels are here and they are ministering spirits to those of us who are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. Don't let your expectation be of that of another man who is like you to lay hands on you. In this particular moment, recognize that the presence of the angels of God are all around because this is in fact holy grounds. We are standing on holy grounds. So let the angels of the Lord minister to you. All through Jesus' ministry, no human laid hands on him. From the time that he was baptized by John and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. But angels ministered to him almost on a daily basis. And those angels are ministering spirits to you also. So lay your hand on yourself if you need to. Stretch out your hands if you want to. But whatever you do, don't let this moment of deliverance pass you by. These angels are walking around in this place with coals from the altar to purify tongues and to sanctify mouths in this place. They are walking around to receive those idols that you are offloading from your heart. Let him save you today from yourself, from the idols. Let him pull you up from every lameness. Lay hold of the horns of the altar today. Tell yourself you will grab the hem of his garment because there's no point hearing these things and still going home the same. Lord, fill my cup and lift it up. Fill my cup and lift it up. 
fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Folks, very quickly, we're going to spend maybe just one or two more minutes, but this is very critical. The Lord brought something to my attention. He just reminded me what he showed me before I saw that other version of myself that spoke with authority. He took me back just to that very moment now and what I saw was he said to me, he said, fear is behind you. Turn around and tell it to leave. He says, turn around and tell it to leave. Jesus says, get thee behind me, O Satan. Get away from me. He said, fear has to go. Makalondo yelo kuma yela mama kum sandele dari gada mama rodo sandele dari gada ba. Now this is a word for sending people in here. He said, "I want you to be reminded that He will not let you fall. There are steps that you need to take, but you're afraid that you might fall. And the Lord is saying, "No, that is me inviting you to come up higher. I'm asking you to come upon your high places. I will not let you fall." Tell fear it's over. You see, because until I did that in the vision, I wasn't smiling, I wasn't speaking with authority because there was a level of intimidation that myself had not overcome. And let me tell you something, not only was I praying for this service, I was praying for myself. And I told myself, in that meeting today, you will receive a breakthrough. And so, it is my desire that you experience the same. So speak to fear. One more time, I say, fear be gone. Ah, la, 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 la. Okay. <clears throat> let me just quickly show you, let me just quickly show you one thing from scriptures. Somebody here, as soon as you said, fear be gone, fear looked at you in the face and said, I'm not listening to you. You see, because this thing is by authority. If you're not speaking with the authority of Christ, evil spirits do not recognize you. Jesus had to tell the Pharisees when they kept questioning his authority. He says, look, don't look at me thinking I was born the other day. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And that's why I'm speaking with authority because I've been around. And so you can leverage the authority of the one who was the Lamb of God that was slain even before the foundations of the earth. So I want you to do one thing. As soon as the Lord showed that to me, he said to them, he said, give them Matthew 7, 1. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, judge not that you may not be judged. He says the reason why fear continues to intimidate some of your brothers and sisters is because they are judging themselves as unworthy to speak with such authority. You're judging yourself, you're like, oh, I don't even think. I know what I did before I left home. I know what thoughts have crossed my mind while I'm in here. The Lord is saying, no. Stop judging yourself because what you're doing is you are condemning yourself. He says, I have judged you with a righteous judgment and you are my elect. Speak with boldness. They say Matthew chapter 7 verse 14. Look at what it says. Because the Bible says narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Why is it difficult for people to find the way that leads to life? Because when the walls are narrow, people are scared. Many people are claustrophobic spiritually. It is called spiritual claustrophobia because the fear is that the walls will cave in on you. But that is the way that leads to life. You need to overcome every fear. Fear of rejection. Some people are not consistent at church simply because the last time they were consistent at church where they served very faithfully, people hurt their feelings, people took advantage of them and they're like, oh. so the fear of disappointment is keeping you from walking in the fullness of what God has for you. Until you pour out that which is on the inside of you, there's no value on the table. Overcome every fear in the mighty name of Jesus. So one more prayer that we're going to say is also there's also a 14 in this one Genesis 14 7 let me tell you something I like the fact that we pray from scriptures in here so that when you get home 
You don't need somebody to lead you in prayer when you get home. You have the word of God. Genesis chapter 14. God said something here. Maybe I'll see if I can quickly show you three things. In Genesis 14. Um, before the next text message, reminder comes to say, time out. Oh yeah. Genesis chapter 14. Now look at what the Bible says. In verse 4. In fact, let's read from verse 3. The Bible says, And these joined together in the valley of Sidim, that is, the salt sea, twelve years, they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year, they rebelled. Let me tell you something. What did Jesus say concerning Mary? He says, wherever the name of Wherever this gospel of, of truth is preached, the name of this woman is going to be mentioned. What is the meaning of Mary? Mary means rebellion. Jesus was born to a person that is called Mary. Mary means rebellion. God knows that his children are in captivity, but he doesn't expect them to continue in captivity. A time is coming where you have to say no to the things that have held you captive. It doesn't matter how long you've been serving in the house of Chado Laoma. It's time for you to say, you know what, fear, I ain't doing this with you no more. It is, I don't know why, but in the last month, God's been hammering on forgiveness. Who is that person that is refusing to forgive here? Please forgive whoever you need to forgive so that we can move on. Because the Lord is saying again, let them go. You might have been a professional grudge keeper. Because I, I know some people, they boast in it. They're like, you see me, if anybody wrongs me, I don't forgive easily. Okay, but you should. And not just easily, the Bible says quickly too. Quickly. The Bible says agree with them quickly before they drag you into legalism. Agree quickly. Okay, I'm going to close the Bible for now. If I let's read one more, because it's like the word of God is so sweet. Revelation chapter 12 verse 7. Let me show you a force that you need to be active in your life. Revelation chapter 12 verse 7. And the Bible says, now listen. The Bible says, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. Good to see you, man. Oh yeah, we've got quite a number of people from Canada in here today. No way, after service, you get to meet Seth and his family as well, and man and Laura. Okay, God is good. Now, let me say this. I was about to close that Bible, and I just saw this too. And you need to live here with this consciousness. Remember, what you know determines your strength. So you need to know this. The Bible says there was war in heaven. And Michael, Michael almost is the same meaning as Moab because Michael means who is like God. Moab means, Moab means like the Father. Okay, so God has been inviting us again and again to be like him. The Bible says, Michael and his angels, they fought with the dragon, that is Satan, right? Because Satan is the serpent in the garden and is also the dragon. That's why the Bible calls him the serpent of old and the dragon that is to come. Because you know that there was a beast that isn't, but was and will come. Anyway, let's not get into that. But <laughs> I just want you to know that Satan is the dragon. When they fought against the dragon, what did the dragon do? You just read it. The Bible says the dragon fought back. Let me tell you something. The reason why you have not had victory over the opposition is because you fought and when they fought back, you ran. It is not over until it is over. Let me just say this. Because many of us, the way we were raised, we were raised in psychedelic Christianity. Christianity of oh all is well it is well with my soul nobody remind nobody told us that we were at war nobody told us that there is war in the heavens heaven is eternity so when the Bible says there is war in heaven that means at any point in time that war can break loose on the earth because eternity can access any aspect of time so let me say this 
that thought that keeps coming to your mind, you need to fight it. It will fight back. What do you do? You fight until you have overcome. So I'm saying that today because this is what I heard of the Lord. The Lord said to me that on Wednesday, he awoke and fear was present. This Wednesday that is coming, one person in here, and I'm going to pray with you after the service. You already know who you are because as soon as I said it, you knew that was you because you, you've been wrestling the fear in this meeting. You feel like, oh, I'm confident in God again. And that fear is gone. No, the Bible says on Wednesday, he arose and the fear was present. You need to keep fighting. It is your season to wrestle. But it is okay to wrestle. The Bible says Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Because if you don't wrestle, you don't get a crown. The Bible says Jesus is coming with his reward. And he only gives crowns to those who overcame. How can you overcome when you have not fought? You can't afford to continue to live with thoughts that don't glorify God, with habits that don't glorify God, with lack of fruitfulness, lack of joy. You need to overcome whatever is sapping that joy and peace out of your life. And those things will fight back, but you need to fight. So if that fear or when that fear returns, don't say, oh, I know this thing is not working. It's working, you're just not working it. They fought back. Okay, this one, last one, I promise, before my wife comes to drag me from here. Now, this is what the Bible says, Revelation chapter 18, verse 6. I'm so glad that I came here because the Lord showed me Revelation 18, and he knows I'm out of time, so I didn't even have to look for it. I just came to it. Revelation 18, 6, it says, Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. I told you earlier on that some people are fasting and bringing out all kinds of cards and, and, and spells because they just don't like your God. Some of them have not even met you. They were scrolling on Facebook one day and they saw you looking happy and they decided to be instruments in the hands of Satan to bring you down. Let me tell you something. Whatever has come against you, the Lord is saying you need to give them double. You need to give them double. So you must be more ready than the enemy that is afflicting you. And how do we live ready? We pray all the time. We love all the time. You see, because you never know when the devil will suggest thoughts into your heart while you're beefing somebody. Don't let the devil take advantage of you. Love at all times. When someone's thoughts come to your mind, don't say, well, this person did be bad, but I love them. I forgive them. In fact, I pray for them. God bless them. Wherever they're at, bless them, bless them, bless them. I would say by so doing you will heap coals on fire on their head but you shall be a free child of Abraham it's time for you to be free so love always let's be seated and we're going to close out with the offering and some announcements praise the Lord if you want to just give God praise where you're at and just thank him for the work of deliverance that he has done in here today <clears throat> please go right ahead I know that we have taken a bit more time today than than we have been lately because we've been starting early so the promise is we start early we finish early but then at the end of the day there is work that needs to be done and the work needs to be done and so thank you for your patience thank you for staying till this time and thank God because you know God is that I mean the love of God is the gift that keeps giving you see what I mean the more we stay in his presence the more he continues to give to us and uh, good to see you guys it's a joy having you here all the way from Canada, Seth and Shay. Good to see you. Let's say let's celebrate these guys, folks. Yeah, good to see you. And Miss Laura, Madam Laura, thank you for coming with them as well. Good to see you. Now, if this is your first time or you've been coming and we don't have your details, you know us, we're not about to sell you an insurance policy. We're not about to sell your information. We just want to be able to keep in touch with you. So over there where it says made new, there are cards. We call them connect cards. And just give us your email or and and all your telephone number however you want us to contact you we would love to be able to reach out to you and let you know how things are unfolding in the life of communion house there are certain times that in between meetings for example when we get a word from god there might be a dream or a vision something that we want to share with you so that you are not left in the dark we are an army and we get to work together some of us are assigned to the watchtowers we see things before they come 
let us be able to share with you the reason why God has put gifts on the body is so that they can be a blessing to everybody so don't be in isolation and don't be afraid I know you've once given your information at a church and then you realize that you know phone calls were pouring in I guarantee you that is not gonna happen here we have intentionally not have not set up such an infrastructure so that we don't get taken advantage of we just want to be in fellowship with y'all alrighty so that is it the given information is on the screen please give only as you have proposed in your heart not grudgingly nor of necessity Again, I want to remind you, we're giving here not because we have needs as a church that God isn't meeting. So this is not of necessity. We give here to worship God. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. Okay? So we're giving not because it's the law. We're giving because it's the love. When God loved us, He gave. If we love Him, we gave. Alrighty? So just give to honor God and to worship Him. So don't feel under compulsion until you're ready to give right. God loves a cheerful giver. Don't feel compelled. But once you're ready, that is the given information on the screen. And while we're giving on the screen, you don't have to pay too much conscious attention to what I'm about to do. It's going to get to you in your subconscious anyway. I'm about to read to us a verse of scripture as we're preparing our offering. It's from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 22, verse 22. Okay? And this is one of those things that I just want you to let settle, let it settle in your spirit, man, especially all through this week. Marinate on it, dwell on it. The angel of the Lord brought this thing to me, and he said to me, he said, this is for now, and he put it down. So let me show you, if you can look up from your phones real quick. He held up a card, and he says, this is for now. He brought it back again, he says, this is for now. And he brought it back again, and he said, this is for now. He says, so now you know, and he put it back down. And so this is what he said to me, and this was what he was showing me, Jeremiah 22, 22. And look at what he says, Jeremiah 22, 22. He says, the wind shall eat up all your rulers. The wind shall eat up all your rulers. That was it. That was what I saw. So the question is this. The people that have been ruling you with a fist of iron, the people that have been making lives miserable, that have been making us too, um, uh, what's the word? Because there's a lot of pressure in the world. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, a music minister, and he says to me, Pastor, it's all about the bills. He said everything is about bills. And I'm thinking, no, it's not all about bills. It's about living the more than abundant life. So there are certain people that have been ruling us with that kind of mentality. And the Lord says the wind is about to blow all of our rulers. Isn't that a good thing? You know, that the ones who have stood as an opposition against the Lord and his anointed, the Lord says, I'm about to blow them away. I'm about to trouble their camp. So what are you going to do? Now that the Lord is bringing you liberty and freedom, will you consume that freedom upon your own loss? Or will you allow your heart as intact as it's about to be to love the Lord? God is doing his part. Do yours. But I'm warning you, if you love those rulers and you believe in them more than you believe in God, when the wind comes, your heart will break for them. Instead of you to break forth into singing, you might be getting devastated at what is about to happen to some rulers. There are political figures that are about to be blown away by the power of God, by the wind that is coming from the four corners of the earth. It is not yours to sorrow along with them, but it is yours to rejoice because God wants you to be under Him. He doesn't need you to follow somebody to their grave. Okay? Follow the risen Savior. But that wind is coming. Alrighty? God bless you. So before we bless the offering real quick, I just want to say thank you to all the people that volunteered on Tuesday after service, where I was it Tuesday, we had a couple of people who came up and said they want to volunteer and some may have come up on Saturday. Please, if you're one of those people, I remember that um, Shayla, you're one of them, I think, you take pictures. So it's not Shayla, who was it? Okay, alrighty, but if you volunteered, whatever you you volunteered to do, please come see my wife immediately after service. Um, I would like for us to have a meeting. Not at, The meeting won't be after service, but see my wife and let's just get something put together in the way of a plan. Alrighty, so if it's you or if you're saying today, I want to volunteer to help in some capacity, please just quickly come after service. It'll be like two minutes and come and see my wife. My wife is right here. Alrighty, Rose Red, you want to raise your hand so people know that's you? Alrighty, God is good. So, now let's package our offerings and be ready to lift them up so we can bless them together. 
God is good. I'm going to just do mine very quickly. I use the Church Center app. And so once I find the app, it's, it's done. But finding it sometimes is the joy. Okay, there it is. Alrighty, and if yours is ready, please, why don't you just stand up with me as we present it before the Lord with praise, with appreciation, and just give God thanks for the privilege to be a blessing in His name. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because you love a cheerful giver. We thank you because you're the one that gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. We're giving to you seed out of the bread, out of the fruit that you have given to us. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, let it be accepted let be acceptable before you as a sweet smelling savor lord this is to honor you it is a symbol of our worship let it be a sacrifice that is acceptable unto you and we thank you lord for this house communion house that is empowered through these acts of obedience lord but we continue to see your will done in this house and through this house in jesus name amen Alrighty, praise the lord well, God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. And don't forget, if you need a card, pick it up from there. And if you need to come talk to my wife, she's right here. See you again.